Now, cerebral oximetry is neither arterial nor is it venous. It's something in between. And how do we know that? Well, through PET studies, we were able to look at the blood volume distribution in the brain. And we know that it's about 30% arterial and about 70% venous in most healthy human beings, even during situations of stress. So the algorithms that were developed to come up with cerebral tissue saturations employ this ratio. 30% arterial, 70% venous. So in other words, what it really represents is a capillary or almost a metabolic value. And that's what you're seeing on the screen. And the normal values are somewhere between 60 and 80%. How do we really know that the number on the screen is truly reflecting physiology? Well, whenever we do something like that, we have to measure it with a gold standard. And the gold standard here would be invasive coaximetry measuring of the arterial blood as well as the jugular bulb blood. So like I was talking to you about before, we know that the number, the cerebral tissue oxygen saturation, is supposed to be comprised of 30% arterial and 70% venous. So if I look at the arterial saturation from arterial blood, times that by 0.3, and I get a jugular bulb saturation and times that 0.7, and I add these two together, that should give me the number that the machine should be displaying. And you can see here, this was the reference SCO2, in other words, the SCO2 that was measured by blood that was taken invasively and calculated with a cooximeter to the SCO2 that was actually displayed by the machine. And this shows you how precise the oximeter is. This is the foresight that I'm showing you right here. And you can see how all these individual measurements here stick to the reference line. And this is actually what, something that is extremely important if you want to use a device well. So you can see right now how good the foresight is here. It has a standard deviation of about 3.7% here. So modern pulse oximeters are about somewhere between 2 to 3% on their standard deviation. The cerebral oximeter is just a little bit higher. So the foresight is a very, very precise device. This was a paper that actually just got published in JTCVS. And it was looking at the same cohort that we looked at, and we wanted to see if we could identify the thresholds under which patients start having more problems. What we were able to show was very interesting. If I look at threshold values here, this is the threshold of 65%. This is the threshold of 60%. This is the threshold of 55%. So you can see patients who went 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, cumulatively under 65%. And the threshold is throughout the whole surgical period, not just the DHCA. You can see how if I take a very high threshold, 65%, that there's almost no increase in adverse outcome. The likelihood of having an adverse event almost doesn't increase. If I take 60% as my threshold, you can see at 30 minutes, I might have maybe a three times, three to four times higher likelihood of having an adverse event. If I, however, take 55% at 30 minutes, you can see it's six to eight times higher likelihood. So the lower the threshold I choose and the longer time that is spent under the threshold by the patients, the more likely they are to have an adverse outcome. And one of the interesting things that I also thought here mathematically is if you look at these graphs, you can see that the 65 and the 60%, it's more or less linear, which isn't that surprising because the longer you're on an operating table, the worse outcome you're gonna have. We all know that as anesthesiologists, right? But if you look at the one here at 55%, this curve becomes exponential. That's why for me, on the data that I've seen so far in my own clinical experience, I use 60% as my threshold. The other thing that we also used is we also used Spearman's correlations to look at thresholds 
and extubation time, ICU length of stay, and hospital length of stay. And we also found correlation, significant correlation. So in other words, the longer patients were underneath these thresholds, the longer they would be intubated, the longer they would stay in ICU, and the longer they would be in the hospital. And what we were able to see, and I don't have a slide for this, but patients who were more than 30 minutes under the threshold of 60, they stayed in hospital on average four days longer than patients who were not. And that correlated into an increased cost of about $8,500.